Hey, it's Chris from Side Effects. Welcome to Hex, episode two. We've got a great lineup of speakers for you. Let's run through them. We recently released V2 of the Houdini Engine 4 Unreal plugin. And to learn about some of the new features and improvements, Side Effects' is Simon Verstrat speaks with the R&D developer Damien Prenoui, who worked on the plugin. And speaking of the plugins, we recently made a big change to the licensing. Houdini Engine 4 Unreal and Unity is now free for commercial customers. It was already free for indie customers, but now it's free for commercial as well. I speak with our VP, Judith Crow, about that. We just published a new Houdini course on crowds by MPC's Mikhail Pedersen. Fiona Wong talks with him about that course. Mardini, our latest daily art challenge, just launched on March 1st. It'll run for the whole month of March. Uh, we catch up with our first animation winner, Carl Drifter. Deborah Isaac speaks with Saad Musaji and James Bortolozzi about a beautiful music video they made for Joji. The KinFX motion editing tool set was released with Houdini 18.5. Fiona talks with Henry Dean, one of the key developers on that tool set. Ben Meir speaks with indie game developer Patrick McAvena about his game Shoulders of Giants. Side Effects' Paul Ambrosiusen talks with CG Wiki's Matt Estella about the Side Effects Labs tools. Deborah Isaac talks about using Houdini for SciViz with Kate Jagueras who recently did a presentation on that at the LA Hug. Then SideFX's Robert McGee shows you the latest improvements to our learning section on SideFX.com. Jeff Wagner recently hosted an Illum webinar on the name attribute, and that included interviews with Mops' Henry Foster and Intagma's Marit Schwind. And we'll finish up the episode with a selection of recently posted Houdini artwork by artists in the community. Let's jump in. Hey, it's Chris from Side Effects. I'm here with our VP of Sales Marketing, Judith Crow. We're going to talk about the release of the Houdini Engine for Unity and Unreal plugin in its free format for commercial customers. Judith, why did we decide to do this? Well, I had been thinking about this for some time. Um, until recently, I was actually director of the games portion of our business. And when we first started discussions about making Houdini Engine for Unity and Unreal more readily available, I was really doing so with, with games customers in mind. Well over half of our customers use either Unity or Unreal. And so, of course, we're always looking for ways for them to vastly expand their usage. But as I took on this new role, I realized there's really an increasing number of, of non-games customers who are using game engines for, for AR and VR. Um, they're using it for virtual production, for real-time visualization of, of all kinds. So really, this announcement aims to please a really wide variety of the studios that we work with. And our, our greatest wish is to have these studios be able to include procedural workflows in every, every aspect of their game or their real-time development pipelines. We've seen in the past that some of these studios have throttled their usage. They've been concerned about the cost of actually deploying Houdini assets widely. But we want to see them make Houdini tools available to everybody in a studio that needs to access them. So that's the big benefit is, is that studios will be able to scale out uh, their use of Houdini assets across even to non uh, Houdini artists. Um, so this, this plugin will be able to go as wide as the, as the full studio. That's exactly right. And in some cases uh, that, that may be, that may even be in the hundreds of, of users, depending on the scale of the studio. The important thing is that everybody in every department can make, some use of procedural processes to make their workflows better. And you can have one or two people developing those tools, but now easily deploying them to absolutely anybody who can make use of them. So what are you most excited about, Judith? Well, obviously, I'm always excited to see further adoption of Houdini. But another really big motivation for us in doing this program is that we really want to build a community of asset creators. So for, for Houdini users, this means that they can distribute the procedural tools that they make in the Unreal Marketplace or the Unity Asset Store. And now they, they can know that there's a very large creator base out there of people making game content and, and, and real-time artists out there who can make use of the tools that the Houdini users have developed. So I'm, I'm just really excited to see what our, our current and future Houdini users can do. Um, you know, if, if you know how to use Houdini and if you're interested in developing tools for non-Houdini artists to use, 
I think you're about to make a lot of new friends. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, I'm really like we're basically helping the tech artists that that are uh, able to create these Houdini assets, uh, bring them to their the wider community and uh, and expose the wider community to to proceduralism. And so that's uh, I'm super pumped about that as well. So how does student a studio get started with this? How do they how do they take action? Well. If we're talking about a the studio that's got some Houdini already and they just want to expand there, it's as simple as going to the website and getting yourself a bunch more licenses. Um, and if you really want a very big bunch more licenses, going to your uh, account manager and, and talking to them about how many you need. Uh, and then you can deploy the tools you're already making more broadly. If you are new to Houdini, um, or even if you just want to get some more ideas about what kind of procedural tools can be useful in, in Unreal or in Unity, then you can take a look at our starter packs that we've made available. Um, these, these packs actually came about in support of people doing game jams using uh, Unity or Unreal, but we've, ex we've added to them and expanded on them um, to, to, to help with this release and to help people understand what the possibilities are. So you'll find art, art assets, um, things like uh, rocks and trees and foliage. Um, you'll find things that are more suited to urban environments like pipes and road generators, uh, wall generators. There are utility tools to do things like managing, creating UVs, creating damaged edges on objects or scattering objects on geometry. And there's some really pretty sophisticated methods in there for creating whole levels, whole game levels, um, by inputting a Photoshop file or by using the wave function collapse algorithm. So a huge variety, it's quite inspirational. So if you're wondering where to start, that's a good place to look, just to start to understand the, the breadth of applications that Houdini assets can have in these game engines. And this new free license comes at a great time with the version two of our uh, Unreal plugin. Yes, that's been a massive development effort over the last ooh, couple of years, really. Um, you know. Unreal, the engine itself, is constantly changing. There's a lot of work to be done to, to keep up with that. And, and the new rewrite uh, has some, some significant um, advantages in it over, over the old version of the plugin. So please do give that a try. And so Unity and, and Unreal plugins are, are pretty much on parity in terms of their functionality. Um, and we will continue to keep it that way. Great. Well, thanks, uh, Judith, for telling us all about the, uh, the, the new license. We hope uh, you're excited about it as much as we are, and uh, have fun. Can't wait to see what you, what you do with it. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I can't to see what, wait to see what the developer community does with it next. Hello everyone and welcome. So I'm Simon Verstaat. I work with SideFX. I have been making tutorials and demos for the game side of things. So today I'm here joined with Damien. So Damien, could you quickly introduce yourself here? Hi, Simon. Uh, yes, for sure. <clears throat> so I'm uh, Damien Fermi. I'm a senior software developer at SideFX, and I mainly work on Houdini Engine and specifically the Unreal plugin. And that's also what we're going to talk about. So Damien works on the Houdini Engine for uh, Unreal, and we wanted to talk a bit more about this plugin. But first, for some people who would be newer to this plugin or this Houdini engine, uh, let's just, uh, Damien, give an overall uh, concept and idea of like what this plugin does and what it can do. That's for sure. Um, so the Unreal plugin, but we, we also have other uh, plugin available for Houdini engine. So what Houdini engine does in general is that it lets you bring uh, Houdini digital assets or HDA files uh, in a game engine or in a DCC. Uh, basically, Houdini engine is just what lets you um, use, modify, uh, control uh, those assets in a, in a different environment uh, than Houdini. Um, so we have plugins for Unreal, Unity, uh, Maya, and 3ds Max. But Houdini Engine itself is an API. So you can write a custom implementation. Um, as for Unreal, uh, what happens is, uh, if I can give like a, a simple example of what you can do with Houdini Engine, let's imagine you have a tree generator HDAs. The asset in Houdini have a few exposed parameters that lets you control the tree height, uh, the number of branches, uh, um, the number of leaves, and everything. Uh, with the engine, you can import the HDA directly in Unreal, and in the Unreal editor, you will have the parameters exposed, the inputs, if there are some that are needed, 
and you can directly control the size of the tree, the number of branches, etc., directly in Unreal in the editor uh, without requiring uh, Houdini. Yeah, it's a great example. And it's also like it's just a so so powerful tool to just open a tool from Houdini in, for example, in Unreal. So that's one of what we want to talk about more is that recently the new version Unreal V2 released. And we want to talk a bit more about these uh, new features. So, for example, one of the bigger features are PGG and the Product Composition Support. So, Damien, let's just uh, tell us a bit more about the new plugin and, for example, the PGG and the Product Composition. Yeah, so we just released version 2 of the Unreal plugin, um, which is a complete rewrite uh, version 1. As you mentioned, the new version of the plugin comes with a lot of new features. Um, so, PDG is one, so that's something that been requested a lot uh, as well, since PDG was out basically in Houdini 17.5, if I remember correctly. Um, what the PDG support in Unreal Min is that you can have an HDA that has a top network inside of it, so a PDG graph um, that's generally used to, like, to cook or do complex tasks. Uh, for example, uh, I'll take like a common example, which would be like world generation. Uh, so you have an HDA, so you have tasks, create a terrain, do some erosion, split the terrain into tiles, get some inputs from curves and things like that, for example, to generate roads, get other curve inputs and generate cities. Uh, then you get the cities and you generate building blocks and etc. And finally, maybe like a scalar pass of foliage and geometry. You could do that with one HDA, like a normal HDA, but that would not be like a, on a big map and everything. That would not be the optimal way. For complex systems like that, where you have multiple HDA talking to each other, interconnected, we'd recommend using PDG. Um, and so the PDG support in V2 lets you basically automatically import an HDA that has a PDG graph and individually cook uh, the PDG graph. And you can fetch automatically, as soon as they're ready, uh, intermediate results. So in the case I've given, as soon as the terrain tile is eroded, you can up import it in Unreal. Um, like a road is generated, like a segment of road is done, import it in Unreal automatically as soon as it's done. You don't have to wait for the whole thing to cook. And then if you change uh, one of the spines, for example, only the invalidated or modified zone is going to be changed and updated. So that's the big advantage of PDG. It's, it's a very complex system, so it's it's, it's fairly uh, simplified in the way I've said it, but that's the idea. And wall composition goes hand in hand with this. This is something that was extremely requested uh, with version one. Uh, basically, when you have a massive terrain, um, I don't know, like 64 kilometers by 64 kilometers, that's it's a bit ridiculous, but they are a massive terrain like that. You don't want to use one uh, height field in Houdini, landscape in Unreal. You don't want to use only one of them. You want to chop that thing into tile and stream uh, parts of the level. So wall composition is landscape normal streaming system for terrain. Um, and the support of it in uh, the Unreal plugin means that if you have a tiled height field uh, in Houdini, the plugin will automatically, when baking, generate the necessary uh, sublevels um, like all the information, the swimming proxies and everything that's required by Unreal um, to handle uh, streaming, so wall composition, basically. That's one of the new features. We have a ton of others uh, new features in V2. Uh, we spend a lot of time improving UX as well. Um, we've had quite a, quite a lot of uh, other uh, commonly requested uh, RFEs that we've implemented, uh, one of them being uh, about the mesh generation. Uh, that's That's been a, a common issue, like we made the Mesh generation process a lot faster to give better reactivity um, in the plugin. Yeah, that, that's something that uh, that I want you to actually talk more about because it had it has been gotten way much faster compared to the other version. Is that tools feel more much more responsive and nicer to work with. So talk a bit just more about these faster mesh creation and also something which is called a proxy mesh, which is also an option that is available now. Yeah. So one of the common issue people had with uh, version one of the plugin was the reactivity in the editor was, wasn't always top notch. So you taking back my tree generator example, you move a slider, so you update the trees, and it would take like a, a slight um, a few seconds, maybe one or two seconds. But that's not great when you want to have immediate or super fast feedback in the editor, because an artist wants to change the tree. And you want to see, like, if I'm moving this slider, I want to see what happens very quickly. So that's one of the common issues we had with version 1. Um, we spent a lot of time basically optimizing. So the first thing we did was optimizing uh, the plugin code itself. Uh, so we've reduced um, the, uh, we've optimized the code, reduced the amount of what we call happy calls, so Houdini engine. So it's data transfer between Unreal and Houdini. 
this takes time. Um, this is, to me, this is something costly. Uh, and so we try to reduce all of these calls as much as we could to basically make the transfer as fast and snappy as we can. Uh, in Unreal, we've optimized the data processing. Once that data is out, uh, we have Houdini data that we need to convert to Unreal data. Uh, we've optimized this as well. Um, but we still had, uh, so that got a lot faster, but we still had an issue, which is once we have all this data, but if you take it and take it and give it to Unreal and say, Unreal, please make a static mesh. All of this, all this nice data from Houdini that's now converted. And that's when we had the issue with Unreal, which is Unreal when creating static mesh, it's something that's meant for importing FBX files. Or it's a static import. So Unreal does a lot of uh, optimization in the background, which takes time. So it, it reorganizes all the triangles, for example, it, it re-indexes everything. Um, this takes time, which slowed down the plugin and gave basically that uh, uh, oh, Unreal is slower, yes, because we are doing static meshes. They are not dynamic meshes or anything. They are made to be uh, imported once and not updated constantly. So we've done the proxy mesh as a way. It's like a completely different type of mesh. That's We talked to Epic, and that's what they recommended us to do. It's basically a visual representation of the Houdini result. Um, so just so yeah, when you move that slider, you have a very fast feedback. Uh, but in the end, you still want the static mesh. So you want to refine that, uh, that proxy mesh to a static mesh. But at least when you're moving that side out, you get a very fast uh, proxy mesh. So you can see, oh, my tree is now that big and it looks like that. Okay, that's fine. Uh, for the proxy mesh, we had to cut a few things to make it obviously uh, faster. Like I said, it's not a static mesh. Uh, if the mesh you're generating has multiple LODs, we're only going to be doing uh, the first level, uh, the, the main level, uh, yeah, the main level of LOD. Um, and if, for example, you have um, collision, we're not going to create that because it's not a final product. It's just like a visual feedback thing. Um, yeah, so that's all. That's all we need. But they're a lot faster uh, than version one. Yeah, I, I really like this feature because it makes tools so much more interactive. Um, so now uh, to end off this conversation, uh, let's. Can you tell us a bit more, like, about the future and some like plans or ideas you maybe have for like the next uh, few updates or releases? Yeah, for sure. Um, so there's we already have. Look, we just released the plugin. So probably the first thing we're going to be doing for the next few weeks uh, is just bug fixing and polishing all the old features of the plugin. Uh, just making sure everything is snappy. And for the future, we already have quite a few. Uh, very uh, common feature request that's been active. Something I've been asked a lot. The first thing we're going to be working on is uh, a new feature that Epic added in UAE 425, which is the landscape uh, edit layers, which is basically lets you insert, uh, it's, it's like Photoshop layers, but for terrain. Basically. So you could insert a Houdini terrain processing layer with using an HDA in uh, your normal landscape uh, creation process. Uh, we have that. We have some features related to KineFX, uh, so skeletal mesh input and animation. So skeletal mesh and animation input and output out of the plugin. Um, we have a ton of other things like spline support. We want to enhance that. We've had a lot of requests for the reverse spline um, that are new to 4.26, if I remember correctly. And the big elephant in the room for the new features would be Unreal Engine 5. So I can tell you that, yes, V2 will support Unreal Engine 5. Um, but we're not going to basically make a specific version for for UE5. We'll keep using V2. The current version of the plugin will work with UE5. Uh, but that's so far that's all I can say regarding UE5. I can't give more details right now. Uh, so that was it for our chat. So thank Damien so much for taking your time to have like a, a small chat about Houdini Engine. Pleasure, uh, Zonlam. Thanks for having me. Hey everyone, uh, I'm excited to welcome uh, Mikhail Peterson. Did I pronounce all of that correctly? Well, yeah, well, yeah, I think it was close enough, but it was good. Oh, okay. Uh, so we have Mikhail here, uh, who is the author of an upcoming, actually, by the time this is out, uh, the tutorial series should be live on sidefx.com. It's actually an overall uh, tutorial series for anyone getting into crowds uh, for Houdini 18.5. I highly recommend it. It's, it's kind of like short, concise segments uh, and gives you clean overview about what you need to care about uh, if you need to bang out some crowd shots. I will let Mikhail uh, say his name properly and uh, tell us about uh, the crowds series. Uh, okay. 
Yeah, so my name is Mikael. And uh, yeah, so this time I've done like a few crowd courses before, but this time I, I try to go more for um, something to get something out quickly. And I, in the past, I kind of have all these details. And that is good if you really want to go into the deep and learn everything there is about crowd. But this time I just, like, like a lot of times, you just want to do something cool as soon as possible. And ragdolls is always the coolest thing that people want to do. So this is the shortest way, but, but still get enough like fundamentals so you kind of understand the process and then go to ragdolls. Well, the fastest I could do it anyway. Uh, there, so, there is guaranteed ragdolls in, in the series, plus, plus car, mm -hmm. car yeah. windshield wiper. Well, no, no windshield wipers, but windshield action. Oh, oh yeah, I should have that. That, that, should, that would be cooler. Oh, and then also I did uh, like a bit of rendering at the end. Well, I mean, I feel almost embarrassed because the renders are not very nice, but I just want to show the workflow for Mantra and uh, Solaris because it's, it's kind of like this weird in between because it's still yeah. kind of, you need to use Mantra still. But Solaris will obviously be the future. So, yeah. So both. It's kind of like the Jean-Claude Van Damme video between the two trucks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm doing the crowd version of that. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> uh, um, so, actually, to give uh, people some context about uh, the author behind the tutorial series, can you tell us about yourself and what you do, how you ended up being kind of, uh, maybe if I can say, de facto a crowd guy, or, yeah. or I'm wrong? Yeah, yeah, it was like a coincidence. It started, I was a journalist for many years, and I was doing like commercials and, uh, and like TV show openers was like a big thing I was doing. Uh, and then, uh, and I, yeah, and I did, I, th I think the first movie I worked on, I was kind of more like an FX TD, and then I got, it was just, I just, uh, applied for for a job online to MPC, and uh, that happens to be a crowd. I didn't even know that it was a uh, crowd TDs back then. Uh, but then I I got it, and then I moved to uh, London the week after, uh, and then I so first. Can I, I ask? Started, yeah. Oh, can I ask uh, actually, like, what uh, crowds software you were using at the time, or uh, that was Houdini, no. or was no, massive? Back then, back then no, because we had our own proprietary software at MPC, okay. so it was Alice. And then we also had built this flocking system uh, in Softimarsh, and this was for mm. Guardians of the Galaxy. That was the first show I worked on. Uh, and then, um, and then I thought, uh, yeah, in the beginning I wasn't, I didn't plan to stay in crowd, but then I really liked it. There's a lot of cool context because you have like these two sides of crowd. You, like the first, you have like the shape of the crowd, so it's, that is almost like the effects part. You need to have that like the crowd work as one and get like this whole like the picture of everything but then you at the same time you need to be able to control like the individual agents as well so you need to be able to go down and then the animation might be wrong and you need to fix that and it's yeah it's a cool challenge to to build stuff to control both those two aspects and uh, plus crowd is so much more than just like armies crowd i mean it can be trees in a tornado it can be Bees, it can be uh, spaceships, it can be like everything. Anytime you have something that is rigged, then it can be a crowd. So, so I, I, I really enjoyed it. But now I'm, I moved over. So I was a crowd TD for six or seven years. Uh, and then, uh, but now I moved over. So now I'm head of simulation for uh, NPC Episodic. So, but that's a simulation that is uh, tech anim, which is our kind of um, CFX and then effects and crowd into one discipline. Um, yeah, so that's what I'm doing now. So I'm still Upgrade, doing a bit of crowd. Complete. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so I still can do a little bit of crowd, but I can also wipe within my, within my horizons. You, you know your stuff, so I, I yeah. recommend anybody who, who needs to uh, get in on, on uh, you know, doing, doing crowd shots to uh, check out the series. Um, and thank you for being with us here today, Miguel. Oh, thank you. Hey, it's Chris from Side Effects. I'm here with the Mardini judges, Rob McGee, Ben Mears, and myself. And uh, our first winner of the animation side of the, of the Mardini Challenge. 
uh, Carl Drifter. Hey, Carl. Hello. So Merdini started on March 1st, on Monday, and uh, we've had uh, already some amazing, amazing entries. Uh, just like with Who Lie last year, just so inspiring to go through the dozens and dozens, over 100 uh, entries on the first day. Um, and uh, it's it's always uh, one of the highlights of the day to go through the entries and, and do the judging. Um, any uh, any comments on the first set of entries, Rob, Ben? Yeah, it, uh, it was really hard to decide. That day one was impressive right off the bat. Uh, that was great. I definitely had a difficult time deciding between both the images and the animations for the first, second, and place uh, th and third place winners. Uh, yeah, it was great to see lots of entries that we could uh, go through and just uh, trying to to pick one or two that that are at the top is is always a challenge. But uh, there's 31 days where everyone will get their turn. Yeah. And uh, there's a prize called the Iron Heart for people that, that do all 31 days. And it's not too late to get into that. So you can go back and do day one, day two, day three. Even though those days are, are, uh, are already passed, you can go back date uh, your entries. So you can still win the Iron Heart. Uh, so, Carl, you uh, won the animation on the first day. What was your process into sort of discovering Mardini, deciding that you were going to enter, and then and then creating that that artwork? I told myself Houdini about four years ago, and you know everybody said Houdini is, is super difficult to learn, and of course it's the same to me. But I, it took me two years to get into Houdini, and now I'm quite suitable for Houdini now. And for last year, I saw the Hulai. It's really really amazing. I really like the work for the challenging artists. They did really blow my mind. But it's pretty that I don't have time at, uh, at, at that time. So now this year, I prepare well. I get a lot of uh, things down before before this uh, Martini. So now I have free, uh, free time in March. So I can fully prepare for this challenge. I want to win the Iron, the Iron Award. <laughs> yeah, so this is what I, what I plan to do. So, uh, and... About this challenge, I think it means a lot to me because uh, as a freelancer, uh, I forget to introduce myself. Actually, I'm a freelancer in China, so just kind of 3D uh, generalist. I focus on simulation, uh, rendering, and shading. So uh, as a freelancer, I did lots of work for others, and this challenge allowed me to have chance to do something interesting for myself, by myself, and for myself. So I, I want to grab this chance to uh, enhance my creativity and think differently. So there are a lot of talented artists. Really, I, I get really inspired from them. And I want to see how far I can go. So including, you know, techniques, ideas, art, and persistence. So for me, for 31 days. <laughs> so I, I take it really serious. And there's a lot of, pays a lot of attention to each piece of my work. So for the day one, bounce. And the first ideas come to my mind is all kinds of ball bouncing around. I think everybody will think, think of these things. Uh, so my first idea was to make a football hitting somebody's face with a slow motion. Yeah. <laughs> However, this asks for lots of uh, simulation test. It takes time. Also, uh, I don't think it will look like beautiful in rendering or composition because I am not allowed to use other uh, model from from outside package. So uh, I, I think it's not very good idea to, to make this. And then I have to Google it. So what kinds of object can bounce? Um, so voila, there are a lot of all kinds of things. And I can, uh, I, I pick up the shaking, shaking head dog. So there are all kinds of shape, but I don't have time to make complex modeling in Houdini. So that's why I choose Emoji. As, as we all know, Emoji is the worldwide expression and also very funny, it's very interesting. <laughs> and we had the really tough years in 2020. Everybody was waiting for a bounce this year. So I want to use my word to express my optimistic and wish everybody a brand new year. Yeah, so this is uh, where I come from, this idea. That's awesome. So thanks so much for that, uh, that ex explanation. Uh, love the idea of uh, bringing a bit of joy through uh, through a daily entry of, uh, of Mardini, that's awesome. 
And yes, uh, really cool to hear your, your your sort of journey into Houdini and how you're using Mardini exactly how we wanted it to be used, which is sort of a way to uh, stretch your skills, to try some different areas within Houdini and, and try some different concepts. So uh, really awesome to hear that you're, you're taking it seriously and, and doing exactly what it's designed to do. So thanks, thanks uh, for entering. Thanks for being part of it. Thanks for uh, embracing the idea of the Iron Heart and, and doing it uh, on a daily basis. And uh, we look forward to seeing your entries going forward. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'll keep trying. Awesome. Thanks, Carl. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Deborah Isaac, and I'm adjunct professor at Drexel University and founder of Houdini School. Today, we're sitting down with the director and visual effects supervisor of Joji777. Hi, I'm Saad Musaji. I'm the director of Joji77, and I'm also a 3D artist and independent director represented by Pomp and Cloud Studios in New York City. I'm James Bartolozzi. I was the visual effects supervisor on Joji777, and I'm currently a technical director at Pixar Animation Studios. First of all, I watched your video and I found it absolutely beautiful. And it seemed very original, both artistically and technically. Could you talk about the limitations you had um, with your production during COVID? And did any of that work to your advantage? Yeah, so we were limited by COVID because we originally wanted to motion capture a lot of performers to do the dance moves for the piece. But because of quarantine and social distancing, we weren't able to. Uh, from that limitation, we decided that Unreal Engine with its real-time capabilities as a game engine would be a perfect piece of software to possibly help us uh, essentially use one motion capture performer, but provide the dance moves for all of these different characters. The tricky thing was that the movements of the characters couldn't be random. They needed to, to be interacting with each other so that the audience could really believe, you know, this was a group of dancing figures. And that was why we used this combination of uh, Unreal Engine and Houdini uh, motion capture techniques um, so that our performer could essentially be alone in the room with the suit and respond to herself in real time so that we could kind of do almost like an onion skinning type of effect with the, the motion capture. I found it really effective in the way that all the dancers' movements were exactly the same. And uh, I think that was an advantage of using one dancer throughout. James, can you talk about um, the the pipeline, the things that you created, your team created, the feathered wings, the fluid sim, the cloth, the crowds, and the lighting? Sure, yeah. So we used Houdini all over the place in this project. Um, I want to give a shout out to uh, Swordfish San Francisco. They helped us out um, with some of the fluid sims and uh, the feathered uh, wing simulation and animation. And Saad worked really closely with them to really nail those looks. Uh, as far as some of the other work, it was pretty experimental. And um, the crowds especially were built up from some of the tools that I had created on the last project that Saad and I collaborated on, which was Tom York's Last I Heard. And with this project, I, I really ramped up um, kind of the capabilities for the crowd animation for um, especially offsetting some of the the animations to do kind of that uh, almost like the wave effect. Um, and on the pipeline perspective, you know, having much more robust level of detail, uh, dynamic tessellation and um, you know, other other uh, deformation systems for garments and things like that uh, really came together in this video so that we could do, you know, much more complex crowd animation shots. Um, but yeah, we, we used Houdini for the crowds, um, obviously very heavily. Um, and then plugging things in like Vellum, 
uh, on top of that was really easy because those tools are already there and kind of just fit right into the pipeline. Saad, can you talk about the lighting? Yeah, so to what James was kind of saying, uh, a lot of what we were doing was very iterative and trying to take advantage of, you know, we have a complex system built up. How can we kind of build off of it? I had been doing these tests with lighting systems to try and create a more unique look on the project. And typically with the lighting of a project, I would, you know, use a couple of area lights and go for something that is, you know, maybe more like a classic three-point lighting system uh, and rely on, on a realistic type of, of light in the rendering. With this project, we used a much more stylized approach. Um, instead of using like three-point lighting or, or you know, a, a, a couple of realistically placed lights, we used groups of lights in a way that was stylized to try and achieve this chiaroscuro high contrast aesthetic. And we would also animate the lights when needed to kind of track them to the characters. Uh, the approach with that was really built around something more theatrical. And we kind of discovered that when you had these groups of very meticulously organized lights composed around figures uh, that were tracking to them, it kind of imitated you know, the way like a stage performance feels. How did Houdini play a role in the experimentation? Were there any happy accidents or unplanned outcomes that you used in the final piece? Yeah, so um, uh, Swordfish was responsible for some of the more art directed uh, shots that from the get go Saad really wanted in the piece. Um, but Early on, I was kind of experimenting with uh, some of our other tools, like I said, the crowds, and um, kind of trying, we, we used Arnold to, to render the, the final images, and kind of experimenting with the Houdini for Arnold plugin and just seeing what we could kind of get out of it. Um, I built a, a Slack tool that would take our renders from deadline and automatically upload them to Slack and then just ping everyone when um, the kind of the, the rendered animations would finish. And so I just started dumping out tons of tests and experiments and, and simulation wedges and, and um, lots of content just automatically to Slack, uh, which was great because it gave a lot of the people in the project a way to kind of peer over my shoulder and, and see what was going on and kind of pick out uh, cool ideas and, and to run with and things like that. So um, Houdini was awesome for kind of pipelining that all together. And in addition to, you know, actually running the simulations and, and getting some cool, uh, you know, really, uh, it, it's a lot of bang for your buck when, when you're dealing with crowds and, and cloth and these simulations, because you can get really complex imagery from, on a, on a user's perspective, can can sometimes just be hitting render and letting it rip. You mentioned how the cloth, you weren't um, originally planning to use that, but it ended up being a very exciting addition. Yeah, so um, like I said, once the, the crowd's pipeline was really um, robust and, and everything was packed into HDAs that uh, we could share between shots and um, between each other's computers and um, it was very portable. It made adding things on top like the cloth uh, a lot easier to kind of see, hey, you know, it's possible. Houdini makes it very easy to just throw on some vellum cloth to crowds. Let's, let's see what it looks like. And um, it only took a couple of experiments, you know, uh, with the character placement and um, you know, kind of how the formation was of the of the dancing, and then the cloth simulation on top was really straightforward. So we could actually focus more on the composition than technically how the heck do we run cloth sim on on these characters. And was this the first time you worked in Unreal? Will you be using this type of pipeline again? Uh, yeah, this was our first project directly using Unreal, and I definitely think we'll be using it in the future. Um, there's so many interesting integrations, especially with Houdini. 
Uh, I don't think we would use it this exact way again, because a lot of that was kind of coming from quarantine, but a lot of what we learned from, you know, the way we used it this time, I think would inform other usages of, you know, what it can do with motion capture and, uh, you know, even some of the other capabilities that are now kind of releasing for it. So a lot of excitement there. Well, thank you both for sitting with me today. This was really interesting and uh, the music video is absolutely gorgeous. So excellent work. Thank you so much. It was thank a you. Real pleasure. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Fianna and I'm from Marketing at Side Effects. And I have a special guest with me today. Uh, his name is Henry Dean. And he is the guy uh, behind KinFX, let's say, um, just for the simplicity's sake. Uh, but before we get into that, I just want to roll back into last year when we released Houdini 18.5. And there was the introduction of KinFX, which is an entirely new framework, let's call it, of uh, doing your rigging um, inside Houdini. And it's it's basically like an entire whole new thing um, and changes the way that you can go go about uh, bringing your your character or or whatever object uh, to life um, and you know having having the guy behind this this uh, new idea and this new way of doing that um, I'm I'm excited to to uh, have him chat about it uh, so Henry. Um, can you tell us a, a bit about yourself and uh, um, what actually let people know how this uh, this idea of, of Kinefx came about? Okay, so yeah, I, I'm a, a London-based um, technical director, rigger. I've been working exclusively in the realm of characters for uh, a good many years now, and but a large chunk of that exclusively in in Houdini, so I was um, doing all of my work within Houdini with the old style rigging tools uh, before I came on board with side effects um, to initially work on some retargeting tools uh, that were still going to be um, using the old object level workflows and when i say object level this is for anybody that's rigged in houdini they'll be familiar with this or houdini users in general but this was a, a more traditional way of building a character rig where you have objects nulls or locators bits of geometry bones and you expose controls to the animator and wrap everything up into a houdini digital asset which is one of the really great things that the old system had uh, so initially, all of the tools were going to be still using this old framework. And um, I think it was four or five months in where one of the early prototypes for using the full body IK solver that we have in Houdini now, this was done at geometry level. There were a couple of underlying technical reasons for it, things that just made sense. The, the way the data was laid out just fitted better on geometry. So that's where the prototype happened. And... Um, fairly rapidly dawned on us that instead of revamping the whole object level rigging system, that actually there was another way that we could go, which was to push further down the path that this early prototype opened up. Uh, and so that's exactly what we did. We looked at it and said, right, we're going to move all of rigging and animation into the geometry context and uh and that's, that's kind of huge <laughs> yeah it was it was a big move so they you know there was lots of work to do at, at the object level there were issues that uh we were very conscious of you know certain performance limitations uh there's so many great things going for it as well and that's part of the reason i started using houdini for for rigging work and i'm not alone in the people that experimented uh with it, there was a you know really great set of set of features in the tool set, but there were a couple of real um, real kickers that uh, were very frustrating. Um, so yeah, here here we are now in this this uh, this new world of characters 
represented, rigs represented as geometry, so not just the skin that we see in the final render, but the actual rig itself um, as geometry. We don't, uh, one of the key things in KinFX is that we don't have, um, we certainly don't have bones, it's a joint-based system. Um, and beyond that, we don't have types as such. So every transform in your rig, every object or control or whatever is just a point. And the hierarchy is defined by the lines that connect them. So, you know, this was something we really wanted to try and get that kind of intuitive feel uh, to how a rig is represented. So when we look in the viewport, we see points connected with lines and this is our skeleton's hierarchy. So that's, uh, that's kind of cool that this kind of accidentally, this whole entire framework kind of accidentally happened, um, but uh, the decision to switch the whole like <laughs> rigging framework uh, into that because it made sense um, is it's kind of cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah it's it, it's a very it's a very exciting a very exciting move it was one we were all very excited to make because it does open up a whole new world of possibilities so, you know different ways of of working one of the the things that was always uh, a problem with the object level workflows and with workflows that we're used to working with as riggers in uh, other packages too is it's a static graph that we're building the rig is a static thing and so if we wanted to do any, all of our automation would happen with complex Python scripts that would, uh, that would just run as a one-off and would you know, put all the pieces together. Uh, one of the exciting things about doing all of this in SOPS is that we can now start to explore more procedural solutions to actually building characters and the rigs that drive them. What things are missing or what, what would help to improve the, the life of uh, a rigger and an animator working in Houdini? I mean, you yourself were doing exactly this. So what, what would you wish for to change? Right. So I mean, one of the things that we did when 18.5 came out is we, we did make efforts to emphasize that the KinFX tool set in its first iteration uh, provided pretty comprehensive set of tools for retargeting motion. So bringing in, you know, motion capture skeletons and putting that animation to an existing character, either imported from FBX or the object level, those kinds of workflows. And it was, you know, it's very much a, either a, a TD or a technical animators tool set. We did emphasize that it wasn't a full blown rigging and animation solution in its first iteration. Uh, despite that, we've seen some really amazing work coming back from the community at large and uh, people really just yeah, putting all the caveats to one side and getting stuck in any way. And we've seen, we've seen some lovely things. Human uh, centipedes. <laughs> all of or yes, and all of those kinds of things as well and flying camels and yeah. <laughs> I think that was the first one I saw was a, a camel retargeted onto a bird, uh, which did make me laugh. So yeah, they, the tool set as it stands is still very much a technical tool set. Um, and it's not ready for prime time rigging and animation. Speaking, speaking personally. Uh, so we want KinFX to be all of these things. We want it to be a comprehensive solution for retargeting, for building rigs from scratch, um, and for character animation at SOP level. So we've got a lot of work to do to, to bring these things to, to users. And we're very conscious of the, the user interface side of things, which is currently quite sparse. Like I said, it's, it's still a very technical tool set. So we're going to be heavily looking at um, UI elements for building rigs and for animation. There are other things which are, again, a little bit ob obscure at the moment. Things to do with layering motion, editing motion, uh, composing animations from, um, from other animations. So a whole range of uh, motion editing tools. Um, and of course, just keeping on 
keeping on pushing the rest of the tool set, improving performance where we know we can. There are lots of gotchas currently. If you try to build a rig in, in KinFX, there are certain things that uh, you need to be aware of. Once you're aware of them, you can work with them, but it still requires a bit of investigation and uh, a bit of question answering. So would really like to lower that, lower that bar and get the tools working a little bit harder so you don't have to uh, constantly keep track of uh, these kinds of caveats. That is, uh, sounds pretty exciting and promising for, for people who want to do more with Houdini uh, in the rigging and animation land, for sure. Very much hope so. Very much yeah. hope so. Uh, well, I, I also don't want to dismiss, uh, like, not not dismiss, but like, I don't want to forget like all the other people that are working together on these uh, tools and, and development inside. Uh, of course, like I, I'm just uh, singling out Henry as the the main bus driver, um, but there's like a whole crew of of developers working on this uh, wholeheartedly. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to to give. Uh, users out there a glimpse of what's what's going on inside um, and hearing from the horse's mouth. Yeah, Henry, I don't know if you have anything else to add for for people, what they can look forward to, or if, or if everyone should just hang tight and wait for things to come. <laughs> yeah, hang hang tight and, and, and just, yeah, it's it just so happy to see uh, what the community at large has been, has been up to with the tools. And the response has been very positive, of course, the um, you know the limitations have all also been bumped into, and we are very much listening uh, very closely to these comments coming back in, and very much hope to meet all of these all of these uh, current issues and and push through them to something new and exciting. Also, so yes, stay stay tuned. Cool. Well, thank you very much for being with us. To uh give us this glimpse today, Henry. We know you guys are super busy and uh, I'll let you get back to, uh, to development. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks very much. Hey everyone, it's Ben with Cytopex and today I am talking to game developer Patrick McAvina. How are you doing today, Patrick? I'm doing good, Ben, thank you for asking. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your studio, Moving Pieces Interactive? Yeah, absolutely. So a um, little bit about myself. Um, relatively new to game development, been doing it the uh, past couple of years. Before that, I was a visual effects artist working in the advertising industry, primarily doing TV commercials. Um, then segued into game development and started uh, Moving Pieces. And Moving Pieces is, is a small independent um, game studio in Brooklyn, New York. Um, we started in about 2019, early 2019. Um, our first project was called Dodo Peak, which is it's classic arcade, um, like retro style platformer. Um, and that came out um, in 2019 for Apple Arcade and Nintendo Switch in 2020. And now we're working on a new project called uh, Shoulders of Giants. And you recently released the teaser trailer for Shoulders of Giants. Can you tell us a bit about the game? Yeah, so yeah, we um, kind of put it out there last week. Um, we're really excited about it. Um, Shoulders of Giants is, we call it an approachable uh, roguelike action adventure game. Um, and it's, you basically simultaneously play two characters at once. You control this big uh, robot mech and on top of him is this like sharpshooting uh, frog. So you kind of switch between like melee combat and also um, shooting um, and the game, there's a ton of like procedurally generated worlds, um, nothing crazy on the scale of like No Man's Sky, but um, yeah, I think more like kind of like Diablo and you kind of like scavenge these landscapes for um, random like abilities and items and you use them to restore life and light to these dark worlds. Oh, that sounds awesome. And uh, just like Dodo Peak, you're using Houdini to make the game. So can you tell us a little bit about how you're using uh, Houdini in the game development process? Yeah, so we're using Houdini in a lot of different aspects of the game. Um, we're, um, we're using it for a ton of procedural modeling, mostly, um, for like a lot of foliage, um, 
rocks. We're also doing, we're also using it to generate, um, to design rather a lot of the levels. Um, we kind of started using a lot of the landscape tools uh, initially, and we're doing some of that, and we're bringing some um, some landscapes in for some levels. But then, some based on our style, um, we kind of wanted more of like hard edge, kind of like geometry. So just using like a very kind of like simple kind of curve based approach, we layer up a lot of different components of like a landscape, and then we bring that in to Unreal, and then we kind of add in all of our different props and assets. Um, on top of it. Um, also using it for some, some effects and also using it to kind of like stylize some other models that we'll get that are kind of poly modeled from our modeler. Maybe like a spaceship, I'll kind of like shatter that up in Houdini and make it look like it kind of crash landed on a planet. Um, stuff like that as well. That's great. Well, we're definitely looking forward to playing Shoulders of Giants and uh, thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. Thanks so much, man. My pleasure. Hi, uh, my name is Paul Mbrojesen. I'm a uh, technical artist at SideFX. I work on SideFX Labs, which is an open source tool set consisting of currently, I think, over 220 tools, uh, tool uh, shelves, desktops, and tons of other stuff uh, that are meant to improve or enhance uh, people's ability to uh, use Houdini faster, more efficiently for production purposes. Um, so welcome, Matt. Hey, nice to be here. Cool. Uh, yeah, so we're here to talk about SideFX Labs um, to learn some more about, you know, how we're working on it, uh, what kind of stuff uh, we do to improve your life as an artist working with Houdini. So I'm just curious to hear from you, um, you know, what role does Labs play in uh, your day-to-day -day work? Right. Um, yeah, so my... Um my current job has um, pivoted a bit from the work that I used to do, which was um, sort of in film and film and commercials and then in teaching. So now I'm sort of playing around the the, the edges of um, of uh, uh, of real time um, and re real time re related fields. But um, mainly what I'm doing at the moment is I'm just just kind of problem solving. So I'm just trying to sort of you know uh, getting all kinds of quite sort of curious, questions from different sort of roles and regions and i just have to sort of quickly think on my feet and think of stuff um and uh i and i happen to have houdini open on my other screen here and a huge part of my day to day is when i get questions like that the first thing i'll do is i'll hit uh, tab and type labs <laughs> and i'll see what's there and i go uh yeah i've got to think about that solution and i go oh yeah uh here's something that i've spent eight, eight hours building um it, it's been sort of a, a a running joke where um, for film is uh, it's a variant on that uh, South Park um, uh, The Simpsons did it uh, episode where for almost any given plot line The Simpsons got their first labs is the same so for, for any given time where I think I've got a really clever solution that I'm just about to mock up I go wait a minute labs are ah, Paul beat me to it <laughs> um, yeah. so I mean like on a day-to-day, -day, it used to be the uh, labs uh, uh, match size or whatever it's called before, uh, match size, was just like a constant thing where that then became the default um, match size node. But, yeah, I mean, just like uh, VAT and uh, what else I got here? The measure curvature, uh, uh, auto-UV I use all the time, the substance one. It's just, you know, it's almost like I can't imagine my day-to-day -day without without labs. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's, it's uh, curious that you say that. First of all, you know, very happy that you you like them. Uh, something that I sometimes get from people, which is usually a joke, where they say, you know, you're you're making my job redundant. What do you what do you feel about that? You know, what what role does Labs play in there in helping you uh, solve solution or problems faster versus you doing that yourself? Like, where does that balance for you? Yeah, totally. I mean, uh, I suppose. Um like with anything, you know, you can either identify with, you know, your self-worth and smugness of, of coming up with a solution, or you can say, well, I've now got to a solution two weeks faster than it would have otherwise, and now I can go solve something else. And I think that's that's how I think of, of labs. You know, I was, I was watching um, a talk uh, last night by Naughty Dog from about 2016 where they were saying, you know, how do you, you know, how do you place value 
and they were talking about about process as being kind of you know the most useful thing about about that stuff. But what was funny to tie that back into th that question and to labs itself, a lot of what they were sort of inventing at the time, which is great and clever, they've all sort of become labs nodes by accident, mm -hmm. really. And and I think uh, for them to say you know to identify with the process, well, I mean I think there's there's something quite nice about saying, well, actually, you know, if I can have a process to solve a problem and it's one node, but it's already been made by someone else, well, then fantastic. I will, you know, I will use that. You know, I think it's a it's a constant trap with Houdini that you know once you really get into it, that you want to solve everything yourself and be kind of you know the smartest kid in the room, and you almost have to sort of get yourself out of that kind of uncanny valley of being of trying to reinvent everything. Mm -hmm. and see that there are tons of solutions out there and, and and labs is where a lot of the kind of best solutions live yeah well that's good so uh you know if if we were to you know build tons of new tools for labs which is of course you know something that we have planned um what strategies do you think would be good to employ for for us as the labs team to figure out uh, which problems you should solve first, because currently we already do that by, you know, being very proactive in terms of reaching out to the community to figure out what it is that people need, um, you know, being very active on social, such as Discord, Twitter, uh, you know, Facebook and the various groups, you know, what would you do? Like, how could we help the community more in, in sort of uh, figuring out what it is they need? People can submit RFEs, you know, they can submit bugs, they can submit questions, but, you know, a lot of people don't seem to do that. And I'm just curious, uh, you know, how can we sort of solve that or how can we become more proactive ourselves in figuring out what it is people need? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think the answer there is, is pretty simple. Just solve my problems. Um, <laughs> and and then after you solve all of my problems, I mean, yeah, I suppose that's that's one of the biggest differences be between labs and everything else. You know, I don't know where you find the time, Paul. Um, and, and, and it was the same with both uh, Mike and... Uh, and Louise, when they were part of the, the team, but you guys just seem to be everywhere. You know, you were available, you know, on Twitter, on Discord, through email, on the forums. Uh, that sense of just being available to chat and to talk mm -hmm. through through ideas. Uh, I mean, um, I'm sure you guys have some sort of internal triage system for kind of ranking. Well, it seems like we've got we've got you know 40 people all asking for this one for this one tool. Therefore, we should focus attention there but um i know at some point you pointed out that there's like a little bit of um there's a feedback button on uh, on a lot of the nodes and whether we just should be encouraging people to use that more or whether you kind of mm -hmm. amp, amp up that side more or yeah it feels like you almost want to bring a bit of you know, kind of you know um mechanical turk to the process where if you make it easy yeah. for people to say no i love this or i hate this or oh, wouldn't it be great if dot 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 but yeah i, I don't know what more you can do really mm -hmm. <laughs> i mean it seems yeah. you're kind of trying to cover all the bases anyway yeah we try to uh you know it, it, we're a small team currently we're two people it's myself and my um and uh you know we, we try and keep it up but we're always looking for ways to to improve of course so I was just curious to hear your thoughts on it because you have a good uh, overview of, you know, what it is people want and what they expect from Houdini. Uh, yeah, I just basically, um, I just hijack that system. So while I <laughs> appear to be thinking of the greater community, no, I'm just thinking about my needs and what I want and you can fix my problems, please. Thank you. That's, yeah, that's good. That's good. <laughs> Do you have any uh, any questions for uh, for us about uh, Outlabs? I I do actually. I did write down some questions, which you've kind of actually you know, partially you've answered in terms of you know, how do you prioritize tools. But then, I guess maybe if you want to talk a bit more about about how you come up with ideas, because obviously some of them do come from just you know from the community and feedback. Mm -hmm. But there are a few that just seem to have come out of your your crazy brain. Like, where do they come from? Um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a lot of it is from direct customer requests because, you know, we're building it for them. At the end of the day, I'm not building, you know, games or movies. Uh, so tools for me personally are pointless. Uh, but for users, you know, they uh, we have tons of meetings with games customers, with other types of customers to uh, to learn about what it is they do. Right. Because uh, 
whenever we meet with tons of customers over the years and months and so forth, uh, we see lots of similarities in what it is that studios are trying to do. You know, Studio A is building a pipe tool, Studio B is building a pipe tool, Studio C is building a pipe tool. There must be a pattern here, you know, <laughs> stating that everyone must need a pipe tool. So let's build a pipe tool that's useful for everyone. Um, so that's one way. Uh, the other way, of course, is by doing internal projects ourselves. So uh, examples of that are, you know, last year's GDC, or not last year's, the year before that's GDC, which was Quixel's Rebirth project, where, um, you know, we were sort of embedded within the team that built that production to really solve, um, you know, content uh, requirements right there on the floor with them. So that that sort of made it specific development for that production. Um, and other than that, uh, oftentimes I also just have general ideas of, hey, let's try and do this weird thing. And then, uh, you know, that then turns into another type tool. One, of, one tool that's a really good example of that is um, the Maps Baker, because that tool didn't start out as a baking tool. It started out as a way for me to uh, build a scattering tool where I essentially wanted a way to uh, scatter points based on uh, distribution patterns. So let's say you have uh, images that are essentially a density map where you have, let's say, wavy patterns or something else like that. I wanted to scatter in that sort of pattern. So I needed a way to get geometry to be read as images so that I could do some compositing operations. And then it started like that. And then, you know, I, I had the thought, hey, but what if I want to bake any other type of attributes? What if I could bake curvature? What if I could bake this? And then, you know, it, it sno started snowballing and then eventually turned out into full-blown baking tool that did normal maps it did you know whatever it is that you want to do for baking yeah, very so cool. a lot of it is organic yeah and then probably so the last question for me is um any kind of hints as to what you're uh, focusing on next uh so what we're working on next um instead of side effects we uh we have some initiatives to to focus on uh, you know user experience and so forth improving that so we've made some concrete plans on uh what it is we need to fix and um, some of that has been categorized as let's try and fix that through labs. And some of it has to do with, you know, some, some more deeper tools in Houdini. Uh, but for labs itself, I'm currently focusing on uh, environments and to be more specific on uh, UV and workflows. So I want to try and um, improve the tool set that we already have uh, to make it uh, uh, even more applicable in, in a larger um, set of problems that people have. I suppose the, the last thing that I'd say is um, it labs used to be like a little bit tricky to get and install if you weren't familiar with kind of with sort of you know, Houdini packages and stuff. It's now in the installer, there's an option which is unchecked. I think it should be checked of you can run, uh, you can install Certifix labs directly from the installer. Uh, it's now part of my muscle memory that when I install Houdini, <laughs> I look for that checkbox, I check it and I get all these cool, cool toys. So that's my advice to the world. Make sure that you do that. Thanks. That's a good tip. Nice to talk, Paul. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for your time. That's right. See ya. Hi, I'm Deborah Isaac. I'm a Houdini educator. I work at Drexel University and also the founder of Houdini School. Today, we talked to Kate Zagororis about her experiences with scientific visualization and Houdini. Hi, Kate. Hi, it's great to be here. I'm a visual effects artist in Toronto and I work for Deluxe. Um, and I've been working in the <laughs> VFX industry for two years and I've been using Houdini for just over three. Why did you wanna start learning Houdini initially? When I first started learning Houdini, um, it was kind of like by pure coincidence. I was in college studying 3D animation and it was a three year program and in their final year, they kind of get everybody to pick a final field of study that they'd like to specialize in. And uh, at the end of my second year, I had no idea what exactly I wanted to do. Um, I'd kind of lived through one of probably the worst years of my life. So by the end of the year, I was pretty tired and I couldn't focus. And I knew that even though I was in a 3D animation program, I didn't really like animation. <laughs> and I didn't like rigging and I didn't like tech. I knew I kind of liked compositing, but I wasn't really sure. And so it really came down to a moment where I was sitting in class and I was up in Unreal Engine and I was making these portals. Um, and I had a teacher walk up to me and he goes, hey, if you like VFX, you'll love Houdini. And 
I was a little bit confused because I had never heard the word visual effects before and I had no idea what he was talking about. So he sh brings up two demo reels of previous students and he shows me and I knew right then like this is something I really, really wanted to do. And so between that point to the start of the next year, I had to basically give myself a crash course in Houdini and learn the software by myself so I could be prepared to make a demo reel the following year. How does your scientific knowledge inform how you build your projects in Houdini? Um, it's, it kind of, it forces me to take a deeper look at everything I built and the logistics of everything. Um, and it also forces me to not come up with any excuses to why I shouldn't try to build something um, in the software because everything I'd like to believe is possible inside of Houdini. It's a huge and huge engine full of possibilities. And just learning the science behind the effects also forces me to look at the smaller elements or smaller structures into what I'm building. Because I think it's very easy to fall into a trap of just creating something to make it look pretty or visually appealing. And especially when you're in a studio, that's by the end of the day, everything has to look good. But you don't, you kind of, in that process, you forget about the science behind everything or the technical aspects of building effects. So by you know learning the scientific theories and knowledge behind things, it can really impact what I'm building because then suddenly I have a deeper knowledge into even if it's just a simple debris effect, the nodes behind it and how they work. You mentioned the next thing you want to explore is chops. Can you elaborate that a little bit? Sure. Uh, so as I think it's kind of known, like. Chops are used for editing time-based channel data, so animation, curves, audio, kinetics. Um, and I could see a lot of possibilities for this tool inside of Houdini. I mean, it's already been, there's already great examples out there of it being used for good, but I also see it as a way of kind of personal growth for myself because I am, I don't know where my skill levels are with Chops yet, but I can see myself really pursuing it in the future involving scientific visualization. Um, and I think when we were talking earlier, uh, we mentioned that like energy emits frequencies and frequencies converted into sounds via wavelengths. So I think if someone was crafty enough or very creative and scientifically uh, motivated, they could say, for example, placing a wavelength of an electron into Houdini with chops and they could do pretty amazing things with it abstract wise or personally for, for scientific projects. Um, so they'd be using a lot of math <laughs> doing that, but I think they'd have a lot of fun. That's really interesting. What would you like to see in the field of scientific visualization and Houdini? I would love for Houdini to be used um, in scientific programs at universities more. I feel like because it is an animation and VFX tool, it gets overlooked or deemed as a lesser tool when it comes to being used in research. And I think that's a shame because it has so many possibilities. Um, and even the backstory of Houdini, one of the creators and developers of the software, Greg Hermervik, helped develop simulations for the Canada Arm or for the Canadian Space Agency on the, uh, and the ISS. So I think if it was used in universities, especially in space-related sciences, it would kind of just, and especially uh, it would bring the software full circle and in the long run, I would love to see the Canadian Space Agency use it as a simulation tool um, because I think, again, it, it would highly benefit them. Do you think it could even lead to new ideas and discoveries while they're using it? Absolutely. I think any software that ha can better explain and visualize a solution to a viewer um, can help create better problem solving tactics and better senses of understanding of complex situations. And Houdini is so powerful when it comes to just basic simulations and visualization tactics. Um, the customization of the software is pretty endless. I've even seen some people use uh, scientific programs with Houdini. So it can be a companion. What mm -hmm. fascinating in the universe. I kind of love the feeling that we're just kind of stuck on this little ball or planet, as you will, uh, just drifting through space and we have no idea what's happening, but we're here to figure out why we're here. And I love, another thing I kind of love about that idea is that we're constantly looking for proof that we're not alone in the universe or where we came from. And there's so many theories surrounding that as well. 
So the search for extraterrestrial life is something that I'm really into and I read about a lot. Um, it makes me very happy and very kind of gives me a very whimsical feeling uh, that we're just sitting here sending signals in the space uh, with research through SETI and NASA, and we're trying to communicate with people or beings. We have no idea where they are, who they are, what they are, um, but we just want to say hi, and I find that so cute. <laughs> It's also interesting that, you know, we're sitting here using Houdini, kind of visualizing that at the same time. <laughs> uh, well, it was so great talking to you, Kate. Uh, do you want to talk quickly about your website? I know you've been very generous sharing your knowledge. Sure. Um, I have a VFX site called Morphe VFX Help. You can find it at katezagoras.com. And I have a bunch of articles on how VFX and uh I guess even VR is being used to um, push scientific boundaries and scientific fields to new heights. Um, and I also have several articles on the history of Houdini and visual effects as well in Canada. So those were really, really fun to write and research because I got a huge amount of feedback from the Houdini community as well. And they've been very, very positive supporting me. Thanks so much for joining me today. It's been so interesting talking to you. It's been great being here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Hello, this is Robert McGee. Uh, I'd like to talk to you today about uh, some changes we've made on the website for tutorials, specifically tutorials where we have um, multi videos associated with that tutorial. So let's go take a look at the website. So here we have um, one of these new tutorials. This is the Smashing Wine Glass. It's a Houdini Foundations tutorial. And so this page starts with the title, the video, and as we scroll up, uh, we see that the video gets locked up at the top here. Down below, we have the descriptions of the various pieces. We have some elements that come with it, like for instance, a full PDF if you wanna download and work through this lesson on your own, um, or you can come back and work through the videos. Now, you can work through the videos by clicking on the titles here, which will go to the next video, or click to go to the next video, or you can use these arrows to navigate through all the lessons. You see how they highlight down below. Now, if you complete a lesson, like I have this introduction here, you'll get a checkbox on that. I got a checkbox on that one because I played all the way through it. Uh, if I go to the third one, I haven't played that one yet. And that progress is tracked along this bar here. Now, this will only be visible if you're logged into the website, uh, but it will allow you to start a lesson, step away from it, and come back and still continue and work on that lesson. So we're going to be publishing more of these multi-video tutorials uh, so that you can track your progress and have a better sense of um, where you stand within the lesson. And, and we've already done this with some other tutorials like this new one on Unity for this VFX magic projectile for Unity. Uh, and we'll be going back to some of the older tutorials that had multi videos in them and putting them into this format um, to allow people to uh, keep better track of their progress through the lesson. So these tutorials join all the wonderful uh, lessons we have available on the website. And as many of you know, uh, the tutorials on the website are both done by side effects, uh, but also by other people from the community. And you can just click submit tutorial if you have one and add it into the site. Currently, uh, this multi-video format is not available uh, to outside authors to contribute. But if you have a multi-video lesson that you'd like to put in that format, just contact me, rmcgee at sideeffects.com, uh, and we can make arrangements because I can do all that at the back end. So I hope you like these improvements we're making and, and enhancements, and our goal will certainly be to make that a formatting option for everyone uh, as they submit tutorials and help grow the community and the learning and skills uh, for everyone. So hi, it's Jeff Wagner. Um, I had the pleasure of interviewing Henry Foster today, uh, developer, lead developer on MOPS, the tools that allow you to do motion graphics inside of Houdini. So Henry, what is MOPS and what audience is it geared for? And as well, is it free or do you actually have to pay for these tools? 
Mops is a toolkit for motion graphics in Houdini, but it's also a tool for handling transformations and other things that, uh, that are sometimes difficult to think about in 3D in general if you don't have it abstracted away. There's a lot of math involved. So it's a way of achieving gestural animation in Houdini where you can just think, I want this group of things to kind of move in this direction or aim this way and by this much. And so it's like, it's very gestural. You don't have to think so much about it. And so you can get really complex animation out of just a few broad brush strokes. So it's great for getting uh, complex behavior out of just a few simple keyframes. Um, Mops itself is free. It's open source. It's free. You can get it on GitHub and it always will be open source. Um, there is a paid add-on called Mops Plus that I released um, at the end of last year that uh, is a little bit more focused on simulation tools. So some of the the uh, the new tools are geared towards being being able to art direct um, simulations the same way that you would art direct things in regular mops. And there's also just a few new tools in general to try to help add things like type, uh, typography to Houdini, um, sort of like a, a more robust tool for dealing with type, um, and a handful of other just like uh, workflows in Houdini that can sometimes be a little bit tricky, and I'm just trying to smooth them over. It's designed for motion designers who are trying to transition into Houdini. That's a, that's a big part of the audience. Um, but I don't want to write it off as being strictly a motion design tool. There is a lot of stuff that you can do with the MOPS tools that are geared towards uh, things that effects artists would typically want. Um, and in, in previous uh, presentations, like the Hive presentation I did last year, I showed a couple of examples of um, being able to sort of manipulate rigid body simulations after the fact because you have access to the local transforms. You can quickly make adjustments or uh, match transforms to each other, things that um, effects artists would would have to deal with pretty frequently. Um, so it's, it's, as always, it's a fine balance, but it's trying to make these things accessible to new users or users in Houdini who are, who are less technical, um, but without making it useless to the technical artists. It's still following the same rules that the rest of Houdini follows. And most nodes have the ability for you to jump in and write the expressions and overwrite things. So advanced users should feel plenty comfortable just overwriting things to get exactly the effect they want. So how does one get mops? Sure. So um, to get mops, as you said, you go to the website, there's a link to GitHub. And from there, you can download a zip of the latest master build. Um, you can also, uh, there's a, a page on GitHub called releases. And if you go there, you'll get, you'll see the latest release all bound up, ready to go. You can just download that. And then there are installation instructions included. Um, the packages method is by far the easiest way to go. I, Houdini introduced packages with a version and a half ago, maybe was it 17? Yep. Um, yep. And they are so much easier than dealing with manipulating the environment file. Um, a lot of pat, uh, other plugins in the past have leaned really heavily on the environment file. And when you're trying to chain multiple plugins together, it can get extremely complicated <laughs> um, for people who aren't used to dealing with the command line or dealing with editing text files for configuration. So um, I would say follow the package instructions um, because all you have to do is edit one file just to point to a different path and then copy it to your packages folder in Houdini and then everything is done for you. If you're a technical user, then I assume you already more or less know how to use GitHub. Uh, and so I would recommend just using Git commands because it will make it easier for you to update later on. And I guess the one question I also have is about Mops Plus. How would you get into Mops Plus? Okay, so Mops Plus is the paid version um, and it is technically software as a service. So you do, you pay um, a yearly cost for Mops Plus, but the yearly cost is for updates. So if you don't feel like you need to update, the software is still yours forever. Uh, so you'll, you'll just be locked into the latest version released when your license expires. As far as getting it goes, if you go to the main website, there, the first link that you'll see uh, in the main banner is going to be for Mops Plus, and that links you to both the uh, change log, if you want to see what's new, um, and also to the purchase link. So all you do is make an account. Uh, it just asks for email and password. You buy a license, either for Indie or FX, uh, and then you're good to go. You'll be, take, you'll, uh, be emailed a download link um, and then from then on, you can just go to the page to, to download whatever the latest version is that you want. Um, and you'll have a link to all of the licenses that you've purchased, which you can use to activate. So you can, um, 
for, for this is important for indie users, especially you can use the same license on both your main computer and a side computer. So for people okay. that like to bounce around and experiment, um, it is a node locked license technically, but uh, you can activate it on multiple stations, no problem. Fantastic. So thank you very much, Henry. It's been an awesome interview, sharing a lot of things about MOPS. And uh, I, I still have to say uh, one final testimonial. Um, another, you know, another user said MOPS is the replace the copy to points that I've been waiting for. And I couldn't <laughs> agree stronger. It's, it's a great set of tools that complements Houdini moving forward. So thank you, Henry. Thank you for the contribution of MOPS and continued support. And everybody out there, uh, Get your MOPS Plus and start uh, diving into the world of motion graphics. And trust me when I tell you this, you don't have to wrangle anymore. <laughs> Do some amazing work. Thank you, Thanks. Henry. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jeff. Thanks for having me here. You bet. Bye. Hi, I'm Jeff Wagner. And today I have the extreme pleasure of interviewing uh, Moritz from Intagma. So Moritz, what is Intagma? And how did it begin? What was the inspiration behind it? So everyone not knowing me, my name is Mo. I'm from Munich, Munich-based designer, 3D guy, jack of all trades. I don't know, whatever you want to call me. Um, used to work in advertising commercials for quite a while. Um, used to use another standard DCC content creation tool, um, which to get into your question, um, I felt limited by after using it for around five six, seven years. So I was bumping into walls left and right and had to really hack it and bend it in order to get what I wanted from this tool. And um, to be honest, uh, my partner in crime, Manu, um, he kind of pushed me towards trying out Houdini and I was kind of resistant to it in the beginning. So he pushed me like three times and uh, twice I stopped using it immediately after a week or so because it was so weird and inaccessible to me, but kept coming back um, because it seemed to be the only tool capable of enabling us to deliver what we wanted back then, which was really non-standard effects, non-standard design, um, using and abusing more complex algorithms, more complex effects tools in commercial work, that is, or in design work rather. So yeah, that's how we got started or how I got started. Motion graphics, um, it seems to be heading in all kinds of different directions. Uh, you know, there's the one, the one hand, you're balancing artist creation versus the technical aspects of the actual production. And if you follow any of the trends on Instagram, um, the complexity of the work now is getting such that um, it's requiring ever more complex tools. And how... Do you personally, first of all, keep on track and get inspired in this in this industry of motion graphics? And secondly, how do you address the growing arms race of complexity, and yet still, you know, be able to um, make this fun? So let's start with the kind of quote unquote arms race of complexity. And uh, I've been discussing this with Manu um, recently. And actually, when you go on Instagram, at least when you go into the kind of more modern, more contemporary. Um, artists and 3D artists, you can see two or three ways of dealing with that. And one is getting good at the tech, getting good at just doing this very intricate effects work. Um, the other is doing kind of a happy middle ground between an abstract design, beautifully rendered, beautifully lit, um, with what I consider medium complex um, tech involved. And then there is the high concept work, which not necessarily has to be technically that brilliant, but stands out um, due to its concept. So um, those are th these three areas that I think you can isolate nowadays um, on contemporary motion design, at least. Um, and I think each one of those areas has its legitimacy. Um, I personally feel more drawn to the technically challenging stuff. Um, I think I would not be the right person to do high concept work. So um, that's what I try focusing on. If you're new to motion graphics or you're an artist that's just entering into this field, um, what advice would you give to these artists pushing into this, this, what seems to be a daunting field these days? I think the most critical advice is to commit. And uh, as we mentioned previously in our discussion, I think 
roughly speaking, you have these two or three different kind of streams within motion graphics currently. And one is very tech heavy, very polished work. The other one is a combination of a bit polished work with more abstract shapes, allowing you to get away with more. And then there's the highly conceptual work. So, um, which lets you get away with technically maybe imperfect results, but the concept is right. So, um, I think one advice would be to make up your mind in which of those areas you see yourself and then adopting your daily intake of um, whatever media you consume that you learn from to your decision. And also another hint would be to just suffer through it sometimes. It can be enormously frustrating learning, no matter what, no matter if it's tech, no matter if it's design, no matter if it's concept. And I'm a person that's easily frustrated. So um, keep your calm or try keep your calm or um, even better, try to find out something to balance out that stress of learning something new and having to keep up um, for quite a good part of your career. Thank you so much, Mo, for the entertaining discussions, uh, wisdom and advice and also um, your, your incredible background and, and the direction that you're, that you're going to be going to in the near future. So um, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Likewise, thanks for having me. Although I'm not sure where you saw or heard wisdom in there. <laughs> <laughs>